She leads a very prestigious um, Darpan Academy of Performing Arts, which is based in Ahmedabad. She comes from a lineage of uh, dance tradition, so has her mother founded the academy and herself is a glorious dancer. And um, uh, so she specializes in the Bharatanatyam and the Kuchipudi dance forms. And she's also a pioneer in using dance and the arts for social change. And so I'll tell you a little bit about that, about what she herself has written. But before that, I just wanted to say what a multifaceted personality she has. She's a writer, she's a publisher, she's an actor, she's a producer, an anchor woman, and she has founded a TV production company engaged in activist programming. And I don't know how she does all of that. She also, in addition, runs Mapin, which is a, and many of you might have seen these uh, wonderful books, uh, um, coffee table books, but of the highest quality. And so it's a Mappin is a publisher of books on art and design. But she's best known internationally outside of India for playing the lead role of uh, lead character of Draupadi in Peter Brooks's Mahabharata. And she went on a tour, on a five-year tour in the 1980s, mid-1980s, with this Mahabharata. So, uh, so let me tell you, she has written a piece called, um, you know, a background to what she's going to perform called Sita's Daughters. And so she explains that in mid-1989, she finished this five-year project working with the celebrated Peter Brook, um, on this Grand Mahabharata project. And playing Draupadi for so long to such varied audiences and seeing the power of performance to change mindsets and influence people, she felt convinced that performance was the language for activism and change. So, um, you know, she wanted to re-explore and wished to re-explore the... Um, um, re-explored the role of women through their eyes. So she had already explored how myth myth mythological and historical women had been understood through the prism of patriarchy. But now she wanted to zero in, and among, among other things, on the need to be bold and break custom for empowerment. So she read many different versions of the Ramayana, and we are told there are no less than 300 versions, to understand where and when it became so unfair to Sita. And in 1990, she started performing in Hindi, in Gujarati, and English. And she realized that the show, although India-specific, was not limited to those who knew Hindu mythology. It really touched all women. It was universal. So for 12 years, she continued performing it all over India and in many countries abroad. And then she laid it to rest for 11 years. And, she, and in 2013, two years ago, she decided to revive it. And because she realized that an entire new generation had not seen Sita's daughters. And she felt frustrated that things had not changed significantly at a fundamental level. And she had wished that the show would have been irrelevant by now. But the show goes on. So please welcome Dr. Malika Sarave in her Sita's Daughters to thank I live in India. India is today considered the second most dangerous country for women. We kill women, we rape them, we pillage them. And at the same time, each of us is told, be like Sita. What does that be like Sita mean when we are blessed with it? It means be an object that your husband keeps or chucks, jump into the fire if he asks, and feel blessed all the time. And yet, if you look at the dichotomy of what this means, 80% of India is Hindu. Hinduism is the only philosophy where a woman didn't come out of a man's rib or a man's beard. The first being was half woman, half man. 
That means empowered women. If you look at the way our gods are addressed, we say Uma Shankar, Umas Shankar. We say Sita Ram, Sita's Ram. We say Radha Krishna, Radha's Krishna. So if this is how somewhere historically we addressed our men, then our women couldn't be such wimps as we make out. So what went wrong? Where did things change? Well, we live in a time of patriarchy and misogyny here differently from India, but no less. And that is what forced me to look at what these women really felt. So did Sita really want to hang herself with her hair? Did Sita really say, tell him not to abandon me? Or did Sita say something else? And it's not about looking at an old myth from today's point of view. It is looking at it from the point of view of women, from the point of view of women who had their men addressed as the woman's man, and perhaps cutting through the male gaze that has kept us slaves for several thousand years. I will start with a small extract from Sita's daughters. And people say to me, what daughters? Well, after you see this extract, I'll tell you what daughters. I'm joined by my colleague filmmaker Yadavan Chandran, who creates a lot of my shows with me and is helping technically tonight. Please, Yadavan. Mother Earth, take me back. This story is over. This cannot be my story, Mother. <laughs> Sarvaguni Sri Ram Bhavamaya Sri Raghuna Kai kai chal Bikare sapne Bekhar huve Sri Raghuna Stay behind Rama, rather I should lead, I am the daughter of the earth, in me lies the gentleness of the nourishing soil and the anger of the earthquake that can destroy humanity. How is it that you, who know me so well, do not know this? I am the daughter of the earth. I know the need of exile better than a palace-born prince. Do you not know that these hands that caress you are capable of holding you up when your courage falters? Come, Rama. Sang Sat Sita Lakshman Nahe Patu Do Mother Earth, enough of these memories. Take me back, open your arms to me. Enough of this story I have. Sita 
yourself what a man you were so that you could show what a great leader you were so that you could have your glorious and bloody war shame rama shame mother earth take me back now i know what this story was about enough i don't want to remember युद्ध के बरसे खाने बाद सत्य के बने से दुबांध सत्य के बने से दुबांध अस्त्र शास्त्र हार अस्त्र शास्त्र हार विजय हुए सत्य श्री राम विजय हुए सत्य श्री राम Memories and dreams have crashed. Who are you in the guise of Rama? Not he, but a frightened, insecure nobody. You say I am so beautiful; it is impossible. I have not been raped. Perhaps all men do not think like you, Rama. You ask me to prove my chastity, to prove my love. Can love be measured? Can chastity be proved? And if this fire burns me, turns me into ashes and merges me with the earth, will you be called an honorable man? A good man who burnt his wife? Yes, Rama, I shall enter the fire. Not to prove myself to you, but to show you what a small man you have become. Know how unchanged I am by the total destruction of my image of you, Rama the doubter. No one thing, Rama. You do not destroy me. You destroy the love and trust between a husband and wife. Mother Earth, take me into your hands. मिला स्वर से लय संगीत एक कान गूंजाना भर बन 
पूजनी सीता ना सोचा ना समझा क्या की पावन पूजनी सीता क्या की पावन was not sorrow it was freedom freedom from a man who trusted a washerman's words more than my absence <laughs> rama wherever you are listen to me i am happy to be free of you now i can bring up my sons to be secure and trusting mother earth open your arms i took part in a weak man's test next time i shall not take part let them be responsible for their own weaknesses Mother, open your arms. This was the story of a man's doubts and fears. How can it be my story, Mother? I shall be born again in each generation, but next time we shall write our story differently. Sita ka. सत्य कहेगी स्वयं सीता सत्य कहेगी सीता का नया कथ्य लिखेगी स्वयं सीता सीता का सत्य कहेगी स्वयं सीता सत्य कहे सीता का नया कथ्य लिखेगी स्वयं सीता कहेगी स्वयं सीता लिखेगी स्वयं सीता and a young girl an indian origin girl came up to me and held my hand and said you know for 20 years i have cursed my parents for calling me sita today i know why i'm sita <laughs> ahalya is another character both from the mahabharata and ramayana and the idiot's guide to ahalya is the following ahalya is the wife of a much older and very famous sage called gautama and indra the god has lusted after her so one day one early morning when the husband has gone off to pray at the river indra takes on the husband's looks and comes and ahalya says but you just went and he says you don't question when a husband asks for your body and so they sleep together and the husband from his third conscious eye realizes that indra has slept with his wife or rather that his wife has slept with indra and comes and curses her and she becomes a stone and she remains a stone for a thousand years till finally rama sort of gently kicks her and she becomes this fulfilled woman now this is the accepted version but ahalya is very interesting because depending on the morality of different periods in history she has changed her story has changed completely so there is a version which says that the god indra became a cock and crowed early so that gautama would go to the river early and knowing that the wife was innocent took on the swarupa of the husband slept with her and disappeared but when gautama the husband found out what had happened he cursed indra and he cursed his wife his wife to become a stone and indra to have a thousand valvas across his body but indra wept and cried and so he was forgiven and the thousand valvas became a thousand eyes there is another version which says from when she was married ahalya lusted after indra so when her husband went off to pray and indra came she knew exactly that this was not her husband but lusting after him she accepted him and when 
he went away. The husband came and cursed them both. And she became stone-like. Till finally, Rama blessed her by being at the bottom of her foot. And now's the fun part. And after a thousand years, her husband forgave her. And forever after, they played with each other's bodies. <laughs> and here is my version of it, which is written by a wonderful writer called Suniti Namjoshi, and which I perform. Yadavan, are you ready? One day, a one-eyed monkey came into the forest. Under a tree, she saw a woman meditating furiously. The one-eyed monkey recognized the woman ascetic. She was the wife of an even more famous Brahmin. To watch her better, the one-eyed monkey climbed a tree. Just then, with a loud bang, the heavens opened. And the god Indra jumped into the clearing. Indra saw the woman ascetic. Uh -huh. The woman paid him no heed. So Indra, attracted, threw her onto the floor and proceeded to rape her. Then Indra disappeared. And the woman's husband, the ascetic, appeared. He recognized at once what had transpired. So he petitioned the higher gods so that he may have justice. The god Vishnu arrived. Are there any witnesses? Just a one-eyed monkey, said the Brahmin. Now, the one-eyed monkey really wanted this woman to have justice. So she retold events exactly as they had happened. Vishnu gave his judgment. Indra has sinned in that he has sinned against a Brahmin. May he be called to wash away his sins. And so Indra came and performed the sacrifice of the horse. And so it transpired that a horse was killed. A god was made sin free. A Brahmin's ego was appeased. A woman was ruined. And a one-eyed monkey was left thoroughly puzzled at what we humans call justice. Thank you all very much. If there are any questions or comments, I would be happy to listen to them or to try and answer them. If not, I hope with a new version, with my company of the Ramayana, I'm working with many different tellings surrounding the so-called given telling that I can come back during the exhibition and show my proper work to you. Malika, man, thank you for a, just what a treat, what a, what, just such an awakening trip. I um, wanted to ask you, so if over the centuries and over the millennia, right, if multiple interpretations and reinterpretations of Ramayana have happened, what's there to stop us from doing a thorough reinterpretation for modern times and, you know, having, a, like, in, in sort of Valmiki's version, you know, Malika Ben's version or well, some Malika such. Malika Ben is doing it. Or some but such. you do know that our former Prime Minister, Dr. Manmohan Singh's daughter, who was teaching history and Ramanujam's version of 300 Ramayanas, her office got ransacked and she nearly got killed. So that's what stops people from talking about it very openly. Hi. You said that you would tell us who Sita's daughters were. Yes. <laughs> so for me, I begin the piece with this rendition of Sita. And then I go on to say that for me, any woman 
who stands up against the accepted norms of society, who is willing to voice her concern, who is willing to fight for what is right in society, is a daughter of Sita. And that luckily they are all over the country, we just need to see them. <laughs> And I also have to say that I then have audiences, I've done over 600 performances, I then have men coming in saying, what about Sita's sons, we are also very feminist. <laughs> so, any more questions? Where do I draw my inspiration? For performing or for life? <laughs> you know, I was very fortunate in being brought up by two families who gave their all, all their lives, for what they dreamt of as a better India. An India that was just and fair and where religion and caste and gender didn't matter. They went to jail, they were exiled, they went to war. I had one aunt who was under house arrest for 14 years because she believed in the Sheikh Abdullah cause. I had another aunt who under Subhash Chandra Bose led the women's army from Singapore because she believed that uh, nonviolence couldn't get India anywhere. And it actually didn't occur to me till I got to college that that was not the obvious option. And I think when I see and meet people who do astonishing things, I think life is so much more exciting when one can open windows. And I have this amazing set of languages, which are the arts. And with the arts, you can actually reach people beyond the walls that they build up. Because if I come to you or I go to a college and I say, I'd like to talk about why men shouldn't be treating women this way, they'll say, thank you very much. But if I go with a performance and the performance is good enough to keep you in your seat, then even if you jump up and disagree, somewhere I have planted something in your head. So next time you read a rape story, you're not going to feel the same. And that's the beginning of change and that's what inspires me. Whoa. <laughs> Malika Ben, thank you so much for the fab fabulous performance and these wonderful comments. <clears throat> I'm very glad you brought up the subject of Ahalya. I think this is a very interesting uh, thing when you look back at it uh, from the point of view of the, the way the woman is represented in a text like the Ramayana. There are actually two versions of the Ahalya story in the Ramayana itself, and it, it highlights this difference that I was talking about earlier. The first one occurs in the first book, and it's as you say, uh, more or less as you say, but in that one the author makes it very clear that she's a very willing participant Pata. in this. This for her is a kind of an adventure. She, 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 she agreed to have the sex, as Galmi, Valmiki puts it, Deva kautu halat, yeah, for, out of curious curiosity about what it would be like to do it with a god. Okay, and she does it, and of course, you know, there's the whole patriarchal thing and these terrifying Brahmins, when they know everything. So, uh, he curses her, not the, the way it is in the later literature, he doesn't actually turn her to stone, he makes her invisible for a thousand years. Yes. And what he does with um, the Inder in that one is, I don't know how to put it delicately, but he cuts, he his, cuts balls his balls off. off. <laughs> yeah. exactly. There are actually five versions, I just exactly. gave the polite ones. But you know, the way this thing has moved forward, if you look at the last book, it's an out and out rape story. Indra comes down and he just rapes her. It's a very brutal story and she still gets the blame. Of course. So this is the classic thing that the Sita story is finally all about is blame the victim, punish the victim. So it's very glad to... That she jumps into the fire and she still gets blamed. She jumps into the fire and she proves herself. And she but still gets blamed. But the end is nice because you show it. She comes, he says, give another oath. Give another oath. To prove to the public that you're pure. And she said, all right, I'll give an oath if I've been pure. Let my mother take me in the hell with you guys. <laughs> yeah. Nice, thank you. Thank you. One more at the back. Sorry. Please wait for the mic. What do you say? I mean, why shouldn't she get the blame? She is a woman. Exactly. And the, and the country is India. <laughs> right. Right, except it's not so different here. Yeah, look at the kind of invective that is poured on somebody like Hillary Clinton 
the minute she stands for elections, it's all about sex and entering her body and tearing her apart and her crushing people's balls as though women didn't want anything else except crushing people's balls. I mean, give us a break. So, unfortunately, the one thing that holds women across times, across countries, across cultures, across colors together is that they are violated, one way or the other. After that feast for the eyes and the ears and the senses and the brain, I think it leaves us all astounded. Uh, I thank uh, Malibka Sarabhai for the most amazing performance. And uh, I just wanted to leave her with one thought that uh, maybe the fact that we had a Rani called Ahalya Bhai meant that she is now being resuscitated and raised from the lower levels to the upper levels. But yes, it is a problem uh, and I think it's something which we need to work through. And I uh, would also like to uh, say that this leaves us all very enthused with the prospect of the coming exhibition on Ramayana, which uh, I think we're all looking forward to with great expectations and great desire to be much a part of. Uh, you know, this story of the epics, uh, the Ramayana, the Mahabharata, these basically, I think, communicate two points. The first is that they try to show the victory of good over evil. And the second is that everyone is responsible for the consequences of their actions. This is a very unique way of looking at things because uh, uh, you just cannot do something and then get away with it. Somewhere along the line, it will come back to you. And uh, this is how this whole pattern seems to work its way, way through. So, uh, when you talk about uh, the various characters, then we've been speaking here about the four characters, but that fifth poor chap, Lakshmana, doesn't find much of a mention. And uh, he was, after all, on a supporting role and he did very well. And uh, notwithstanding that, he seems to have been somehow left out in the whole picture. And what's worse than Lakshmana is Sumitra, because she was left behind in Ayodhya and uh, nobody seemed to bother the f about the fact that uh, she also did a, perhaps a larger uh, sacrifice than even Sita in being left behind. But uh, they sort of glossed it over and forgot about them. So I think it's very interesting if these points are also brought out in the course of this um, exhibition, which I am sure will embrace the, not just here, but embrace people uh, and cultures across the world. We've just heard about the number of countries which have been uh, influenced by the spreading of the story and the culture of the Ramayana across much of Southeast Asia, East Asia, up to Japan. And uh, uh, thanks to the communities of migrants, travelers and traders who have gone across, it has spread to many other parts of the world, including by Indians who've gone to places like Fiji and uh, South America, uh, the Caribbean. And of course, also thanks to the migrants who've come here, uh, we, it is very much a part of the system here. And I'm very happy that Usha and I had the privilege of witnessing the Ramayana played by the Mount Madonna School at Watsonville, Santa Cruz. Uh, where for the last, uh, since 1978, they have been doing the Ramayana and it's an amazing performance and it shows how in such a 12,000 miles away from India, there is this school which is every year putting up, there have been parents and children who've been doing this role year after year. So it shows that this is something which is truly vibrant, truly alive, and I was really amazed in, at that performance, and I think it's really remarkable that's, that, that the school has been doing this kind of job. And uh, finally, on a closure, I would like to say that I would like to compliment uh, Bob and Sally Goldman for their incredible work in this 24,000 verses, and uh, maybe now that they have completed this, uh, the Mahabharata is only 100,000 verses, so... <laughs> 30 years for this is 120 years for the other one. So, <laughs> and you know, the Rishis used to live very long lives, so I think that could perhaps be translated here too. Thank you very much.